Hello, everyone. Thanks again for tuning in to these Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids webinars. We're going to get started with our Marine Protected Area, Why Should We Save the Seas talk today. Um, if this is your first time joining us, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about who OPAC is. Um, OPAC stands for Ocean Protection Advocacy Kids. We are a nonprofit that is headquartered out of Plymouth, Massachusetts. Throughout the school year, we offer marine science art and advocacy workshops to students in grades K through 12. Um, we offer those both in the classroom and at our headquarters at the Center Hill Preserve in Plymouth. Um, we're really excited to, to be here today. We're sorry that we can't be in your classroom, but thankful for Zoom and YouTube so that we can continue to share our ocean education. Um, Again, we're a nonprofit organization. Our mission is to empower youth to become curious ambassadors for the environment through the arts. So unlike a lot of other um, ocean organizations, we really do try and get you to become the advocates for the ocean because the ocean doesn't have a voice and we have to give it one. And a lot of the work that we do in advocacy is through artwork. Um, and today we're gonna be Kind of identifying some common concerns about our oceans and thinking about how we can use marine protected areas to solve some of those issues. We're going to brainstorm ideas on how we might protect our ocean. We're going to explore marine protected areas. We're going to look at some examples of what has worked in the past and what has not worked in the past. We're going to define what a stakeholder is and what their role is in this whole process. Um, again, we're going to look at some uh, case studies. We're gonna learn how to actually create our own marine protected area. So I'm gonna walk you through the steps of what a policymaker might be thinking about as they're putting their hat on to create a marine protected area. Um, we're gonna do a little bit more but with advocacy at the end and I will have a live question and answer. So hold on to those questions, maybe write them down. Um, try and only use the chat for those questions and comments. I'm just gonna start with a, a short video to get us going here. When you think about the ocean and you think of how important it is to life on this planet, it's amazing that in 2014, only 2% of the ocean was protected in any way at all. That means 98% of the ocean was open to fishing, mining, drilling. And when you have that kind of pressure on something so vital to the planet, it's, uh, it's just not sustainable. In September of 2015, the nations of the world got together and agreed upon the Sustainable Development Goals. And for the first time in history, they decided to make the ocean one of those priorities. There's a specific goal to protect 10% of the ocean by the year 2020. We need the ocean. We need the ocean to be healthy. We need to protect parts of it so that we can have a more resilient, healthy planet. This study builds upon and uses some of the best research that's out there. We took 10 maps that have been created by UN agencies, by conservation organizations, and what we did was pull it all together. We overlaid these maps on top of one another to find out what areas is there general agreement that these are important areas to protect that would actually make us reach the goal of 10% by the year 2020. I really think that increasing the amount of marine protected areas is the most important thing that we can do to save the planet. There are many benefits, bigger fish, more biodiversity, better economics. Marine protected areas, in many cases, also help sequester carbon, so it can help mitigate the effects of climate change. There are so many proven benefits, and we really need a lot more of them than we have now. We're collaborating with scientists from all around the globe. Not just scientists, but also conservationists and diplomats, um, governments. We, um, you know, this is not a problem that's going to be easily solved and it has to involve cooperation of lots and lots of people. Uh, thank you for Stony Brook for putting that short video together. I think it's a really good overview of 
what we have been doing in the last few years and what we need to do to collaborate to continue to have a resilient ocean. And marine protected areas are gonna play a large part in how we move forward as a blue planet. And I always like to start this workshop off in the classroom with asking, why should we care about the ocean? I mean, that is the basis of why we should create marine protected areas. And just simply put, the ocean provides half the oxygen we breathe, more than half the oxygen we breathe. Every other breath we take comes from the ocean. So to stay alive, we are relying on the ocean. It's a pretty good reason to care. Um, as they mentioned in the video, uh, the ocean is a huge regulator of our climate for temperature and sequestering carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, most of what we have in our houses has at one time been on a boat. Uh, transportation of goods is a ginormous industry on the ocean. A lot of us really enjoy uh, recreational activities near the water, whether that is in a marine or freshwater ecosystem. Um, the economy is heavily driven by ocean activities. Most of the world's population lives near a coastline. Uh, and food and medicine are pretty obvious reasons for why we should care about the ocean. So what is a marine protected area? Uh, kind of, this is my definition that I always use. It's a clearly defined and regulated marine space that provides long-term pro protection and conservation of natural, economic, and cultural values. And I always like to stress that marine protected areas are not just set up for preserving the natural habitats, but we need to think about the broader things like cultural and economic values. Uh, marine protected areas conserve, manage, and protect uh, the environment. Marine protected areas aren't always no take, no go zones in the ocean. Most of them are actually multi-use parks and we're gonna get into that a little bit more as we talk here. An important note, marine protected areas can be managed on a local state federal or international scale. So how are marine protected areas designed? And this is kind of a simple version, but there's six things that we're gonna start thinking about. The first is where should we put it and how big should it be? Size does matter when we're talking about marine protected areas. Um, we want to think about what we're trying to protect and how strict we wanna be in the regulations of what we are protecting. Believe it or not, we do need to think about how long that marine protected area is gonna be there. We are in a evolving climate. Is it going to be a seasonal marine protected area or is it going to be permanent? Um, how is this new protection that we're setting up for this ecosystem going to impact us and the species that live there? And who's going to enforce this protection? Is what we're trying to set up realistic? Can it actually be um, implemented and followed. So the, the first question here is how big, or sorry, how big should it be and where should we put it? Um, so I would always say in order to set up a marine protected area, we actually do need to have geographic boundaries. So we need to have a map or a chart. We need to know the coordinates of what we're trying to protect. Um, if people don't know where this marine protected area is, how are they gonna follow the rules that we're trying to implement? Uh, marine protected areas do have a pretty dramatic size range. The smallest marine protected area in the world is in British Columbia. It's rough, just under five acres in size. So think about three and a half football fields. It's the, the little square in the middle of the map there. And on the other end, the largest marine protected area in the world is the Ross Sea Marine Protected Area. Um, of which 72% is fully protected from fishing. Um, so you will see on the map here, there are different zones where different levels of protection are in place. And this marine protected area is just shy of 300 million football fields. So very, very big. And the reason that we can make a much larger marine protected area in Antarctica is that there aren't as many people in Antarctica. It's a lot easier to enforce something where the, the means of actually getting to that marine protected area are much more difficult. Um, we don't, most of us have not been to Antarctica. A lot of us have been to British Columbia. Uh, there's 
that is something that we need to think about when we're establishing these boundaries and the size of what we're trying to set up. Um, what should we protect and how strict should we be in protecting it? So there's kind of three categories that marine protected areas fit into. Uh, we are thinking about healthy ecosystems, we're thinking about cultural heritage, and we're thinking about sustainable production. And those three categories fit into the natural, cultural, and sustainable production or uh, economic heritage. Our natural heritage is what everyone tends to think of when we're thinking about protecting the ocean. These are the, the biodiversity, the habitat, the ecosystem, so the, the fish, the whales, the plankton, the coral, uh, the natural things in the ecosystem. Cultural heritage is a little bit more difficult to think about, but uh, I always like to use our town, our headquarters town, to describe this. And uh, when people think of Plymouth, they often think of pilgrims. And that's okay, uh, because culture is just as important to protect as our ecosystem if we want to have um, a resilient uh, area down the road. So this can also include things like shipwrecks. Um, this can include um, the Native American cultures in an area, but there are other reasons to protect, put, a, put aside part of the ocean than just uh, the ecosystem that's there. And then our economic heritage or our sustainable production, I always like to say is a combination of the first two, because if we don't have an ecosystem, it's hard to sustain it for the future but we do want to establish a marine protected area so that our grandchildren and their grandchildren can have the same resources or not, or even better resources than what we have right now. Um, how long will it be there? Well, right from our definition of a marine protected area, we're talking about something that should be permanent. It's really hard to think about setting something up that might fail, but that is something that we should think about. So oftentimes marine protected areas are conditional on their success or failure. So we'll say, we're gonna put aside this parcel of ocean, we're gonna put these regulations on it, and we're gonna come back in five years, 10 years, 15 years, and 20 years, and see if what we did is working, if it's not, what can we do to tweak it? What can we do to make it better? Um, and then occasionally we actually just set up marine protected areas for a short period of time. Uh, and this could be something like the cod fishery in New England, where there's uh, temporary closings on quotas, um, where we don't let people fish, but we're not saying that they're never going to be able to fish. Is it seasonal? So if we're thinking about protecting a focal resource, so let's say right whales in Cape Cod Bay uh, in New England, we don't need to shut down that part of the, the bay to ship traffic and fishing for the entire year because our right whales aren't there all year. So sometimes we can make marine protected area enforcement seasonal. So those regulations are only there for part of the year. Um, think about great whites and other marine megafauna that migrate. This is similar for um, shorebirds. A lot of beach communities have uh, partial beach closures during um, seasons when our migratory birds are laying their eggs. So it doesn't have to be all year. Uh, how will this protection impact the ecosystem and evidently how we're gonna use the system because we are humans and we are all about us and how it's going to impact us. So I would like to say we need to be careful about what we want to change before we understand how that change is going to happen. And if we were swimming in the ocean and we knew nothing about whale sharks and we were coming up real close to a whale shark, we would probably be very nervous. That thing's big, it's scary, it's gonna eat me. That's our primal instincts. But in fact, if we go a little deeper and we find out that this shark actually eats plankton and it has no interest in me, uh, that's gonna change how we think about putting restrictions on that ecosystem. It, going to eat different things. Uh, it could change what type of fishing regulations we're putting on there. It could change beach closers, um, which is a big issue on the Cape close to us here in Plymouth. Um, so 
we don't know a lot about the ocean. We've only explored 10% of it. So we need to be careful about what we try and implement in areas of the ocean we don't fully understand because it might have the wrong consequence. Um, we might actually be doing more harm than good sometimes. And we also do have to balance economic and social values with our conservation efforts. Uh, money drives pretty much everything in our political climate. Uh, and if we say we wanna close down a fishery because we want to sustain a species down the road, that's gonna have some pretty immediate economic and social impacts on a community that relies on fishing for livelihoods. Um, and most people think, okay, we're gonna shut down a few boats for fishing. It does have ripple effects down the line um, all the way to the supermarket where prices are gonna be changing because we have more or less fish being caught. Uh, there are transportation industries and ice industries. There's a, a lot of things in between uh, a fish coming onto our plate that are also impacted by our efforts of fisheries management and marine protected area access. And then one of my favorite questions about marine protected areas, uh, who's going to enforce this protection? So we have this great idea, but we need to make sure it's realistic. Uh, and I love this little cartoon. It starts off with a shark saying, looks like I found my lunch and the little fish saying, you don't wanna eat us. Um, we're friends with a four ton mammal that knows echolocation. And the shark responds, I'm not afraid of whales. And then as you can see, we actually have a bat pulling that shark out of the ocean and saving our fish. So when it comes to marine protected area in protection and enforcement, uh, we can't have a four ton bat that's going to be out perusing our oceans and saving um, the fish. <laughs> it needs to be a little more realistic and grounded. And the best way for marine protected areas to succeed, uh, research has shown is that stakeholders at the beginning are the people involved in the process of creating that marine protected area, all agree to the rules that are being put in place. Uh, an example I like to use is your rubric for a graded assignment or um, your agenda for a week in class. If you have a plan in place and you agree to it and then all of a sudden it was switched up, most people wouldn't be okay with that. Uh, so we wanna keep things enforceable by having people agree to them when they start and not dramatically changing them as they go. Um, so I would encourage you to think about some other hurdles to enforcement of marine protected areas and you can post those in the chat section and we can get to them during the Q&A at the end. Um, it's not just the, real, the reality of something that can um, cause a marine protected area to not come into fruition. Um, so what are some common types of marine protected areas that we find in the United States? Uh, there are four types I'm gonna talk about here. The first are national marine sanctuaries. There are 14 of these in the United States. Uh, these are established through a uh, law, through Congress and uh, NOAA and public process are how the little details get worked out. Uh, the local example for us here in Massachusetts is Stellwagen Bank. This is a multi-use marine protected area, meaning that you can do a lot of things in Stellwagen. Really the only thing you can't do in Stellwagen Bank is dredge or mine the sea floor. Uh, you can fish, you can boat, uh, you can do science. There aren't a lot of regulations put in place. Um, even the, the traffic laws this time of year for right whales, they're voluntary. I have a nice article for you on our website about how those voluntary restrictions aren't always followed and what that can do down the line. Um, the, other, the other type that's on a federal scale are National Marine Monuments. These are established through executive order. So this is the president declaring that we need to put something aside for protection. This is similar to a national park on our terrestrial systems. And uh, a New England example are the Northeast Canyons and Seamounts. It is the only national marine monument on the East Coast. Seamounts are really important for biodiversity in our ocean and upwelling of nutrients to the surface, which brings in um, a lot of really important uh, keystone species to this ecosystem. Uh, protecting the seamounts 
also is protecting against oil drilling off of our coast and ripping up the bottom of the seafloor. Um, we have research reserves, which are one of my favorite types of marine protected areas because these are purposely set up to do uh, science and education. And we do have one pretty close to our headquarters here in Plymouth, which is Okoye Bay. Um, and my lab at college actually was able to use this site. It's really beautiful and I'm really happy it's set aside for the future to be able to not just do research on how climate change and sea level rise are impacting the Cape Cod coastline, but for everyone to be able to enjoy, uh, if you're familiar with Cape Cod, if this parcel of land was not put aside for uh, protection, it would probably be really wealthy homes. Uh, and then we have marine wildlife refuges. These are really uh, commonly protected for migratory species like birds. And um, the big example on the Cape is Monomoy National Wildlife Refuge. If you haven't been there and you live in the area, it's a great spot to uh, stay away from people and social distance yourself. It's a great hike. There are horseshoe crabs there this time of year, as well as a lot of beautiful birds. All right, so I actually have another poll question here for you. How much of the ocean is actually protected? Now that we have been talking a little bit about how we would protect something, it's fun to guess how much we have actually protected. So I'm just gonna open up a quick poll here and everyone wouldn't mind just quickly putting in your guess of how much of the ocean is actually protected by marine protected areas. I'm gonna give you uh, another 10 seconds, put in your answer. So the majority of you have said that it is less than 6% of the ocean. And you are partially correct. Um, sorry, technical difficulty there. Um, You're partially correct. So this is one of the maps from a website called protectedplanet.net which is a wonderful resource for uh, marine protected area databases. And all the darker blue areas are marine protected areas. And you can see at the bottom here that about seven and a half percent of the global ocean is covered by marine protected areas. But when we're talking about a marine protected area, that, num that percentage can change pretty dramatically by what we're defining a marine protected area as. And like I said at the beginning, we can have multi-use protected areas, which some of which really don't protect anything. They're more of like a cultural site that says, you know, we're putting this part of the ocean aside because it's important and we want people to know it's important, but we're not gonna regulate anything that you do there. Um, so that can increase the percentage of marine protected areas that are out there. We're not saying that they don't count, but they might not be doing what we would expect them to be doing. And then you can see that the number at the bottom there, 2.45%, are those exclusive no take marine protected areas. So parts of the ocean we're putting aside that people cannot fish from, they cannot dredge, they cannot take um, precious minerals from the sea floor. Uh, this is a, a number that we definitely need to increase. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that as we go. And I always like to compare our marine protected areas to our terrestrial conservation areas and we have done a little bit better on land. We protected about 15% of our terrestrial systems. And I always like to point out on this map here that if you look at the, the greens, the protected areas, most of them are in unpopulated areas except for Europe. Uh, but if you look up in uh, Greenland, we have a huge protected area. We have the 
rainforest in South America. We have the Sahara Desert in Australia. Um, we have big parts of Alaska. And this goes back to the Ross Sea example of our marine protected areas. It's a lot easier to protect land if it's not in our backyard, if it's off in nowhere, which isn't saying that we shouldn't protect it, but we need to also be picky about what we're protecting because we don't want to protect ecosystems that aren't diverse. Um, if we're going to set aside land, we want to make sure that we're protecting the biodiversity of our planet, um, which means that we need to be a little bit more realistic on where we put some of these protected areas, both in marine systems and terrestrial systems. Um, so um, there were some goals put aside uh, for the last decade to try and reach 10% of our oceans being protected by 2020. And you can see here from this figure that uh, again is from the protectedplanet.net, which is a great resource. Um, we're, we're falling short of that. Uh, we're doing a little bit better with our terrestrial systems. We're almost there to the 17% goal. But then when you move to the right, uh, we also want to make sure the marine protected areas and terrestrial conservation areas that we're setting up are being managed in a way that's actually useful. And you can see that those marine protected areas, most of them are not doing so great with their management. Um, we are doing a little bit better all the way on the right. We can see with trying to protect areas that are biodiverse, um, which goes into our reefs and our coastal systems where we have a lot of life. And I, I always like to poke in, how is the United States doing with these goals? Um, you can see that we're at almost 15% of our area being marine protected area. That number is a little bit skewed because most of it is in the Pacific um, around our islands. Not saying that that's a bad thing, just saying that we could do a lot better if we were to protect more of our coastline um, with more strict regulations. Again, uh, most of that is in the Pacific Islands. Uh, if you go to the MPA Atlas or protectedplanet.net, you can investigate a little bit more where those marine protected areas are. Um, just a little look towards the future on what we can do here with marine protected areas. Our ocean is facing a number of huge challenges, unprecedented from overfishing to plastic pollution to the impacts of climate change causing the collapse of entire ecosystems. All too often we're disconnected to the ocean, yet we rely so heavily on the ocean for our well-being. Es evidente que debemos cambiar la forma en la cual estamos a gran escala tratando el mar porque todo el mundo que depende del mar como una fuente de alimentos, como fuente de conocimiento y también como fuente de valores culturales importantes y trascendentes para la sociedad, creo que estamos en el camino correcto. Un congrès comme euh, on est aujourd'hui à l'Impact 4 sont très importants parce que c'est le moment où toute la communauté de techniciens, de direction, de ministres parle de l'importance des aires marines protégées. Marine protected areas is one of our last hopes to come back to something that we can call a live ocean. So the strategy for marine protected areas is to protect areas which can act as refuges, can support the migration uh, of species, and thereby make sure that we have a resilient marine system for the benefit of life and ourselves. Implementation of marine protected areas needs to go beyond drawing simple lines on maps. What really matters is the effectiveness of management, how we engage local communities, how we work together. We have the power to change our attitude, to change our behavior, to take actions that can protect the very nature of the planet that keeps us alive. Hoy día estamos en un momento histórico y un desafío histórico, en donde el mundo puede elegir si es que pone en jaque el futuro de sus hijos y los ecosistemas que sustenta el mundo o enfrenta estos problemas. 
And if you are a young professional, get involved. Join the Young Professional Group of the World Commission on Protected Area and help us shape this global network of change makers because we know what to do. All we need is action and we need to act now. So I, I really enjoy that video for two reasons. One, it shows that we can all be part of this social change and this needed change to protect our planet and our oceans. And it also shows you how many different organizations are involved in these uh, international agreements. And we've seen what is protected, but how much of the planet should we actually protect? Um, and the first sustainable development goal for this year's um, was set for trying to protect 10% of coastal and marine areas. Uh, and this was through the UN, so a consensus driven body. And it doesn't look like we're gonna hit that 10% in 2020. So the next big push is to try and protect 30% by 2030. And that is going to be up to all of us. We all can have a, a part in this really difficult goal to get to, but needed goal to achieve. And again, this is actually being currently negotiated right now. Um, so similar to a sustainable development goal and the enforcement will be through an international agreement of the United Nations. And this is a consensus driven body. So going back to the fact that everyone needs to agree to the rules before the game starts. It's an ambitious goal, but it is grounded in all of the science that's out there go back to the first little video clip I showed you from Stony Brook, uh, scientists are looking at multiple sources and drawing everything together and seeing which parts of the ocean are um, a consensus that needs to be protected and what we can do to get there. Uh, there's a wonderful source out there, the Campaign for Nature, that will show you some of the scientific articles that um, are helping this goal move forward. And believe it or not, the ultimate goal is to protect 50% of our planet. Uh, and that will help us protect the biodiversity that we need uh, as humans to survive for many, many, many generations to come. Who cares about marine protected areas? Uh, we all should. This is a, a wonderful little graphic that I was lucky enough to see in my first marine policy class that I took in college. And it's the Mississippi River watershed. And instead of naming the rivers and tributaries that run into this river and eventually out into the Gulf of Mexico as marine policy, uh, we've labeled them with stakeholders that are involved in the process of creating marine policy. And to start, what is a stakeholder? A uh, stakeholder is anyone that has an interest or a concern in something. So we're all stakeholders in the ocean, if you're caring about the ocean. And some common examples are politicians, scientists, fishermen, the business community. And as you can see on the chart here, we also need to think about how those stakeholders will bring law, regulation, history, culture, religion, and the status quo into that policy. It's really hard to change things that have been set in stone for hundreds of years. Think about fishing communities that have been going to the same spots to fish for a long time. It's hard to tell someone that they can't go there anymore. They have to change what they're doing. Uh, think about changing your routine right now. It's really hard to change what you're used to doing, but we can do it. Uh, we're all adapting right now and we can all adapt to changes in how our ocean needs to be regulated in the future so that we can continue to have it as a precious resource. So I, I wanna spend a little bit of time, not a lot of time, uh, talking about kind of the basic marine protected area theory. Now, this is super simple. Um, we can draw our little circle in the ocean and say, okay, we're gonna put a marine protected area right here and we're gonna call it a multi-use protected area, which means that different parts of this marine protected area are gonna have different levels of protection. 
Uh, you can say, see here, we're going to have a fishing reserve. We're going to have an ecological reserve. Uh, part of this marine protected area is going to be right on the coastline. Some of it's going to be a little bit further out in the ocean. But we do want to show people that uh, this is protected land. And I have a, another great video for you that's um, in our resources on our website that can go into this a little bit deeper. But the theory here is if we have our ocean with no protection and we just let fishing happen as normal, so business as usual, people will go out, they will fish, and we will end up with dramatically less fish. Um, on the other end, if we just put a little part of this same area that we started with aside as a no-take reserve. Uh, so that's going to be the yellow here. And we continue the same game. So we have our same fishing industry going out. They're going to fish the part of the ocean that they can. And you're going to see again, we have dramatically less fish. But what changes here is over time in our no-take zone, we're going to end up with more fish and bigger fish, and those fish are going to spill out into the rest of the ocean. So if we can take parts of our ocean and say, you can't fish here because this is where fish breed, this is where fish migrate to, whales migrate to, we need to protect this spot because it's biologically and um, culturally, economically important, hopefully in the long term, that will spill over into the rest of the ocean and we can have a, a much healthier ecosystem overall. So it's not trying to tell people they can't fish at all. It's trying to say, we need to protect these critically important parts of the ocean so that we can have a healthy ecosystem overall. And again, I have another video for you if you wanna watch it at home, the link will be on our website that goes into this a little bit deeper and some more of the economics of it. I wanna look at two case studies really quickly. The first one is a successful marine protected area. Uh, these are both marine protected areas that were done on a federal or national scale. Uh, the first case study we're gonna look at is Cabo Pluma. It's in Mexico. We're gonna watch just a short video on that uh, that shows you how much of a rebound has happened in this marine park. And then I'm gonna talk about an article that was written just a few weeks ago about a marine reserve in New Zealand that has completely collapsed in the last 20 years. So let's start with just this short video here. This is Cabo Pulmo here in the Sea of Cortez, a tiny ocean community with a big story to tell. A story about how the local people sacrificed an entire way of life to create a world-class marine reserve. Today, the shallow seas of Cabo Pulmo are teeming with life. More than 200 different species of fish make up a vibrant food chain, which has put the reserve in the record books as one of the healthiest on the planet. Cabo Pulmo, a small dusty village well off the beaten track, came close to collapse as a result of overfishing. I meet dive operator David Castro, whose grandfather used to speak of the glory days. He used to tell me, like 30 years ago, you, you, you can see like thousands of sharks or thousands of uh, groupers and all, all over the place. 20, 30 years ago, and there were all those species, they really disappeared. Old photographs were all that remained of those bountiful years, until that is, David's father led the calls to save the bay. Tomamos la decisión de hacerlo con una fe y una esperanza de que sí va a funcionar, porque de todos modos la pesca estaba muy difícil, muy duro, muy, invertirle mucho, y dijimos, eh, eh, si nos dedicamos a la conservación y trabajar el turismo, pero principalmente la conservación. So in 1995, they realized their ambition by creating the Cabo Pulmo National Marine Park. 7,000 hectares of bay within which all fishing is banned. 
Since then, there's been an explosion in marine life, a 400% increase, the greatest of any reef in the world. This photograph of David in among a monster school of fish known as jacks has been seen around the world and has come to symbolize the success of Cabo Pulmo. It's an image which has helped to inspire a valuable tourist trade of mostly snorkelers and scuba divers. So time for me to find out if the park lives up to its new reputation. Most of the dive sites here are no more than a 10-15 minute boat ride, but today we're going in search of the legendary schools of Big Eye Jacks. Get ready guys. One, two, three, go. They school in their thousands, a giant swirling mass of big eye jacks, gathering in such large numbers they almost blot out the sunlight. Today's bustling fish population is clearly worth more alive than dead, a spectacle that never ceases to amaze. I don't really have words to tell how I feel every single time I go down because it's insane. Not surprisingly, the sheer quantities of marine life have also prompted the return of the apex predators. Powerful bull sharks are now sighted almost daily during dives, especially on the site of a small wreck. The park's director couldn't be more proud of the local people who've made it all happen. I'm very proud of uh, knowing these uh, heroes for me uh, that have been doing preservation since they almost some of them this, they, they were born. Scientists describe this as the most successful marine reserve in the world, a shining example to many more countries and communities. But it doesn't end here. Mexico has ambitious plans to turn up to 10% of all of its seas into marine protected areas, clearly inspired by what's happened here in Cabo Pulmo. So obviously this is an extraordinary example of what a marine protected area can do. In 15 years, 463, there was a 463% increase in fish biomass in this reserve. Um, it's remarkable how much the ocean can rebound when we just leave it alone for a short period of time. And you are allowed to fish in some of the um, surrounding areas of Cabo Plumo. And there are some smaller fishing communities that are indigenous to this space that can use certain parts of the reserve. Um, but I like to also point out that having our keystone species are apex predators coming back and a healthy ecosystem also increases the economy of this region because it on average let's say a fish costs 30 dollars to eat at a restaurant it's 300 dollars to go on a dive um, so our tourism industry definitely increases in some of these areas because it's now rare to see parts of the ocean that are that pristine on the other end um, we have our marine park in New Zealand that was established 20 years ago and was kind of landmark when it was put out that we were going to protect this gulf. And in the two decades since it's been created, it's actually done nothing. Um, it's overwhelming um, because if you can see here, this is, I know it's really blurry, but the, the darker blues here, they are the marine reserves. So if you look at the, the map, there aren't, most of this whole marine park is not actually close to fishing. Most of it, you can do things like dredge the bottom and go out and commercially fish however much you want, um, which hasn't helped the ecosystem go forward. In fact, um, one of the, Large resources there are crayfish, I think of like a lobster. Um, 
they're basically extinct now, which has led to a dramatic increase in sea urchins. Um, and all of this has also impacted coastal birds because they don't have enough food to eat. Um, and what looked like was gonna be one of the first countries to meet its sustainable development goals has now not, it, it isn't even close. <laughs> um, and the, the sad part about all of this is that four years ago, there was a collaborative effort to try and reverse this trend and it hasn't been implemented, which shows you that this whole process is difficult, um, even when you get a lot of people in the same room uh, to balance economic, social, and natural systems is no easy task. Um, but I did wanna show you the difference between when we establish something, we follow the rules, we can dramatically increase our fish populations and our health in Cabo Plumo, and then here in New Zealand, uh, 20 years later, nothing was really protected. Uh, this is a marine protected area that you could, I guess, say it was a circle on a map. Um, we haven't done what we intended to do. Uh, so I wanna quickly just talk about these activities for home and then we do have some time for a Q&A. Uh, I would encourage you to like us on Facebook. It's the best way to see the future webinars that we're gonna put on as well as programming uh, when things go back to normal at our headquarters here in Plymouth, as well as beyond. Uh, I have put together a few activities for you to do at home. The first one here is just kind of comparing and contrasting a few marine protected areas that are out there. There's three links there. They're all databases of marine protected areas that are out there. You can learn a little bit about who's enforcing them, their boundaries, what they were established for, if they were successful or not. And then using both this webinar and what you've learned in your compare and contrast, um, you can, I put together a prompt for you to create your own marine protected area to see some of the difficulties and questions that you would have to ask to establish a marine protected area. Uh, when we do this workshop in class, I would be there with you to help you. So please, um, I opened up a forum on that same website for you to ask questions and I will try and be there to help you through that process. I would encourage you to watch uh, a documentary called Mission Blue, which is about Dr. Sylvia Earle and the creation of hope spots, which are parts of our ocean that hopefully will become marine protected areas. Uh, you can go on that Campaign for Nature site that I was telling you about earlier, and you can sign up a uh, pension to help protect 30% of our planet by 2030. And um, there's just a few videos there and articles so you can learn a little bit more about some of the examples of the success stories I was telling you about from marine protected areas, as well as um, how we can use peer pressure to actually help us save our seas. And again, all of this will be linked on our website, uh, www.opakedu.org, um, and then just click the link for our webinars. Um, some things that you can do to protect your local waterways when it's safe to do so. You can conduct a beach cleanup with friends. Uh, you can volunteer or intern for a local conservation organization. Uh, we're always looking for help. I know other organizations are too. Stay informed about local issues. Every town and city has their own bylaws and to actually create change on a local scale, you need to understand those rules so that you can be a change maker, be a better recycler. Most of us are not good recyclers. Clean your recycling goods, learn how your municipality recycles so that you can do your best in making sure what you're doing is actually helping them be better recyclers as well. Skip your single use plastics. Um, and if you live anywhere near watershed, nitrogen heavy fertilizers are not helping um, at all. So cut down on the fertilizer, be outside. If you're not outside, you can't actually care about the ecosystem because you haven't seen it and understood it. Tell someone what you learned today. We often define advocacy at OPAC as telling a story. So being the voice that the ocean needs. If we're not spreading the need for protecting our oceans, it's not gonna happen. And above all, you can write your elected officials. Uh, as you saw in our examples of marine protected areas, we uh, many are established through congressional law. So if our officials don't think that 
we need more protected areas, they're not going to go out there and advocate for them for us. Our ocean can't wait. And uh, this is just gonna be the time that I open it up for some questions. If you are on YouTube, I will try and answer those questions after the broadcast. Um, but for now, I'm just gonna answer questions on Zoom. So this would be a, a good time if you have any questions to pop into the Q&A. Um, are there marine protected areas in Plymouth? The answer to that is yes. Um, we have a few. Uh, we have the Ellisville State Park, which is a what we call an area of critical environmental concern, uh, which is a marine protected area in a coastal region. And that extends up to another local town uh, area called the Center Hill Preserve, which is actually where our headquarters are, right on the, the coastline in Plymouth. Just want to pop in any questions now. Now it's the time to do so. Um, somebody said to know what to protect in a marine protected area, you must have somewhat explored that section of the ocean. And since according to a statistic stated last webinar, we have only explored 10% of the oceans. So does that mean that we have to sort of explore another 20% in 10 years? Yes, we need to do better at conducting research, but we have also understand how generally most ecosystems work. So if we're talking about coastal areas, we know that we can put a, uh, some of that aside to protect it. Um, and we understand how coral reefs work. So it's on a general scale, uh, we haven't explored everything in the nitty gritty details, but we can definitely put things aside so that they're safe. Um, how many marine protected areas are in Massachusetts? I don't know that number off the top of my head, and I should, but uh, if you use any of the databases that are out there uh, that I shared with you on our resource page, you will be able to find that answer. Are there universities and organizations that have internships for students in high school? Yes, OPAC has internships for students in high school, as well as um, many local environmental groups in Massachusetts and beyond. Um, does OPAC work with NOAA? Uh, we do not directly work with NOAA. No, we do not. Um, but we, we do, we are part of the Massachusetts Marine Educators Association, which through that, there are some people that do work for NOAA uh, as, and um, one of our board members works for the New England Aquarium and works with marine policy. Uh, so we definitely bounce our ideas off of people. I've been trying to protect our local beaches, but my mom won't allow me to go to the beach. What are some things I can do from home to help? Keep educating yourself. Um, if you don't know, you can't solve the problems. Um, we can be better recyclers at home. We can write our own blogs. You can do your own webinars. You can create art. Uh, you can keep uh, watching some of the videos that I've shared with you, just trying to be more grounded in the issues so that you can share it with other people. What else do we have here? What types of people R slash should be present and heard when designing a marine protected area? Uh, that's a great question. We want to have people from all backgrounds at the table. We want to have fishermen. We want to have the business community. We want to have scientists. We want to have politicians. Uh, if the people that are actually going to be enforcing these issues aren't at the table, it's going to be hard to have them follow the rules down the line. And uh, fishermen definitely are some of the people that push back the most because if we're talking about a marine protected area, often it's for fisheries regulation and we are going to impact their livelihood. What is the most rewarding part of your job? Being able to share our information with all of you guys and 
I'm really happy that there are mediums like Zoom out there for us to continue to teach, even when we can't be in the schools. Take a few more here. Um, good question. Do you have recycling info that you can share? It is sometimes confusing about what we can or cannot recycle. That's a tough question because every town does things a little bit differently. And the best resource that you can do is calling your public works department in your town and asking them what their regulations are. Uh, I'm going to do two more questions here. How do protected areas face climate change? Great question. Uh, so if we're preserving more of the ocean and we're keeping it healthier, it's going to be more resilient over time. And resiliency is really important for when uh, things are being impacted by climate change. We want to make sure that we have healthy ecosystems so that our ocean can continue to persevere. And it looks like that might be it for now. Um, again, I've opened up a link on our website to ask more questions. I hope you do that. I hope you can continue to do our activities on our website. Uh, I just want to share lastly that we do have one more webinar this week. Uh, it is on horseshoe crabs tomorrow. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about their anatomy and their history. We're going to do a little reading from a local author that wrote a book on horseshoe crabs. And then we're going to give you a prompt to write your own horseshoe crab story. I would like to note that we're able to offer all of these webinars for free, thanks to our generous supporters in the past. And uh, for us to be able to continue to offer these webinars for free, uh, we would love to have a little bit more support going forward. Um, and we do plan on offering more webinars for as long as school is closed. And the details for that will all be on our website, as well as on our social media platforms. So please do like us on Facebook. That is the place that we put all of our uh, live news up on. Thank you again for joining us today, and I hope you can come back tomorrow.